Okay, I want to begin the discussion of microbial nutrition, and I want to do so by introducing, once again, the electron transport chain. And the reason I'm introducing the electron transport chain here is because this is the same way that majority of the energy is produced in our bodies in the mitochondria, or the more specifically, this machinery is in the inner mitochondrial membrane. Um, this same machinery, essentially, is also found in the cell membrane of bacteria. So it's not found in a separate organelle, it's actually in the membrane itself, or in the plasma membrane itself, but it still serves the same purpose. It sets up an electron, uh, proton gradient rather, and that proton gradient is then used to drive the synthesis of ATP from ADP and inorganic phosphate. So this is a really important point, and the only real difference here is, is between the different types of bacteria is, is how they go about doing this. Is you know what what is the final electron acceptor, for instance? And so I wanted to say that all these life forms basically require some electron flow. Okay, this electron flow drives the processes of life. Okay, essentially an electron transport chain, and the movement of ions into and out of the cell drives the synthesis of ATP from ADP and inorganic phosphate. And the electrons come from the breakdown of nutrients. Now, where those electrons come from is another one of the fundamental differences. Um, some bacteria are photoautotrophs, meaning they derive that um, the electrons from the breakdown of water or hydrogen sulfide or something along those lines. Um, but others are, are not. So there's very, basically what I want to say here right now is that microbial nutrition is diverse. Microbes are diverse. They can use a lot of different things to um, derive their energy and also their, um, and also their electrons. So a good way to segment into that is to then start talking about the different nutritional types. And there's several different nutritional types um, depending on... depending on the microbe you're talking about, or the specific bacteria you're talking about. So we have photoautotrophy, which generates its energy through light absorption, okay? So photoautotrophs, they generate their energy through light absorption, but by the photolysis of H2O or hydrogen sulfide. And uh, the energy can be used then to fix CO2 into biomass. So the energy that's derived from the splitting of, say, water in this case, can actually be used then to fix carbon dioxide into organic molecules. And those organic molecules, um, you know, are usually something like glucose. So we have photoautotrophy. And the difference you're going to see in all of these nutritional types is that each one of these nutritional types, the main difference is basically where they get their electrons from and where and what their carbon source is. So that's that's pretty much the differences that we're going to see. And moving on from photoautotrophs, I have chemoautotrophs, or sometimes they're called chemolithotrophs. You'll, you'll see that maybe in a textbook. And um, they produce their energy from the oxidation of inorganic molecules, such as iron, sulfur, or nitrogen. Um, the energy is then used to fix CO2 into biomass. The so same principle, I mean, you're using something, say, let's, let's say the Calvin cycle is one I can think of off the top of my head for carbon fixation. And um, they're using, say, the Calvin cycle to fix CO2 into glucose. So then we have um, photoheterotrophy, photo which produces energy through photolysis of organic compounds. And the organic compounds are broken down and used to build biomass. And the classic heterotrophy, or heterotrophs, which most of us are, are familiar with, they break down organic compounds from organisms to gain from other organisms to gain energy. And they harvest carbon from those from that uh, organic matter that they're breaking down or they're consuming and um, use that as their carbon source. So basically they use both, say, glucose as both a carbon source and an energy source. So it provides the energy and it also provides the carbon. In this slide I'm talking here specifically about autotrophs and um, I just wanted to kind of show the comparison here between heterotrophs and how they gain their energy and also phototrophs and how they go about um, gaining energy. So autotrophs have two different energy sources. They can either have mineral oxidation or light. So what I'm talking about here, if I'm talking about mineral oxidation, I'm talking about um, chemoautotrophs. Okay, I'm talking about the use of some inorganic molecule, breaking it down, using the energy from the breakdown of that molecule um, in order to fix carbon. And if I'm talking about 
photo autotrophy, I'm talking about light. But the main thing you'll see is that they use the same source of carbon, okay, both use CO2. And I have my own chart that I designed here just to kind of show that point and kind of drive that point forward. So we have light absorption, so I'm talking about photoautotrophs. Anytime you have light, you're talking about photo. So photoautotrophs, they go through the process of photolysis, okay, that's the breakdown of, uh, say, the water molecule. And then we have NADPH and ATP, and that goes into the process of CO2 plus H2O, which is fixed into glucose. So this is the carbon fixation part, and this is the energy portion, okay? So this is where you see the CO2. And the, the, really, the things I wanted to point out here, the main things I wanted to point out here, was that we have mineral oxidation and light absorption. So we have two different energy sources. So if we're talking about photoautotrophs, we're using light. If we're talking about chemoautotrophs, we have mineral oxidation. But in the end, really, the carbon fixation process is, is the same. They're going to use the same process, basically, to fix carbon. And they're going to use the same carbon source, more specifically, that being CO2. So now I also have a little um, brief discussion here about heterotrophy. And the process of energy acquisition is complex. There's several different pathways that lead to the production of energy. So basically what I'm trying to say here is that there's several different macromolecules, amino acids, glucose, lipids, that all pretty much lead and filter into the same pathway. That, the main pathway being really the TCA cycle. That TCA cycle is what creates most of your reduced electron acceptors. And it also creates a little bit of ATP, and, and um, but those reduced electron acceptors go into the electron transport chain, and they donate their electrons to the electron transport chain. Those electron energy is harvested from those electrons, pumps protons across the membrane, which allows for the establishment of a proton gradient, and that is really where the potential energy is stored that drives the, um, the changes in conformation of ATP synthase that results in that ATP production or that high level of ATP production much higher than what you could get from say like a pathway like glycolysis okay you can you could definitely couldn't get the kind of energy from that that you could from the electron transport chain so I just wanted to kind of point that out and show those some of those subtle differences I want to transition here into talking about culturing bacteria and it, it may not make sense why I'm talking about culturing bacteria at this point but really a lot of this stuff about the microbial nutrition is extremely important when you're trying to culture your bacteria. You have to know a little bit about the bacteria's nutrition because if you don't, you won't be able to grow it in under sterile conditions. You won't be able to grow it in a petri dish essentially. And a lot of times what you'll do is you'll make some agar. You'll make some kind of agar and that agar will have again some macronutrients and micronutrients that are required by your bacteria. Or in some cases, you may have specific strains that lack the ability to break down or lack the ability to make a certain molecule, okay? And um, if they can't make that molecule and you don't add it to the medium, then you're not going to be able to grow the bacteria, basically. So it's important to understand a little bit about the nutrition if you plan on growing these things in the lab. So culture media has all of the necessary materials for growth, okay? You know, generally speaking, the most cases you're dealing with a cultural medium that's just you know has some nitrogen source some carbon source and some basic vitamins and minerals um but it varies for different species okay um every species like i said has their own um choice has their own um specific nutritional needs and the electron source you the, the, some of the things you'll have to provide if you're going to grow the bacteria is an electron source some energy source if it's not phototrophic. So if it's not phototrophic, you've got to provide some energy source. Um, you need to provide a carbon source. If it's not a photoautotroph or an autotrophic bacteria, you need a carbon source. And you also need a nitrogen source. I mean, these are just the basic components of life. I mean, this is basic nutrition that y you and I need. So if not capable then of nitrogen fixation, then you've got to add a nitrogen source. And this is usually accomplished pretty, pretty simply in the lab. And another uh, interesting thing, this, this is something I actually personally worked with just recently, was McConkie medium. Okay, McConkie is a, is a specific type of medium. And the interesting thing about McConkie, and you will find some of these things, is that McConkie is both selective and differential. Okay, so what do I mean by both selective and differential? Well, McConkie specifically selects for gram-negative bacteria. So if I have some solution and I have multiple bacteria in that solution, let's say, and I don't know exactly what I have to, um, 
and I don't know exactly what at this point I um I have, but I want to know, and I know that what I'm looking for is gram negative. So what I can do is I can then culture that you know that mixed culture into the um you know I can do dilution streaking here in order to um, set this up, and I get something that looks just like this. And it should, in most cases, and this isn't always perfect, but it should select for only the gram-negative bacteria, right? But it also differentiates between gra two different types of gram-negative bacteria. Um, the gram-negative bacteria that can ferment lactose, lactose rather, <clears throat> and those that cannot ferment lactose, okay? So it selects for those. And in this case, this is a lactose fermenter. And you can see that this is a lactose fermenter based on the pink color, this hot pink looking color in here is neon pink. That's an indication that this is a lactose ferment fermenter. So not only can you differentiate between gram negative and gram positive bacteria, you can also, you, um, or rather you can select for gram negative and gram positive bacteria, you can also differentiate between those that ferment lactose and those that do not ferment lactose. And the last thing I want to talk about in this video is just the process of dilution streaking. This is an important technique to be able to do and to get pretty good at because it's one of the main ways in which you're going to separate the bacteria in culture. So you, let's say you're given a liquid culture. You need, to, um, you need to now transfer that liquid culture to McConkie. Let's say you want to transfer it to McConkie medium because you know you have a mix of a gram negative and a gram positive bacteria and you want to separate the gram negative bacteria. You want to separate both of them, of course, but you know with McConkie, you should be able to select for the um, gram-negative bacteria. So what you're going to do is you're going to essentially sterilize the loop first. That's what the flame is for. And you're going to heat it up, get it red hot, wait a couple of seconds, dip it into the culture, the liquid culture, and then begin this process of streaking. And you can see that this is a, this is a very simple process, but again, it's important that you understand it and do it right because you'll, you, you won't end up separating the bacteria if you don't. So you do your first set of, you, you do your first streak here, you know, five, say five uh, swipes across with the loop. You flame the loop again, you always want to sterilize it, and you don't dip it back into the culture or anything like that. What you do is you choose another spot over here and you then run the loop back through a few times, only a few times, you can see that here, back through the original streak. Okay, and each time you're essentially diluting it more and more. Okay, you're getting less and less bacteria on the loop. So you continue doing this again, you flame it and you do it a third time and then possibly a fourth time. I would usually recommend doing it a third time only and not a fourth time, but you can do it either way. And then what, what you end up with is, is just this. See here you have this really large number of colonies. It's really hard to, to get a single colony, but what you really want is you want these single colonies because those single isolated colonies likely developed from a single cell. And if that's the case, then you know you have something that's pure, it's a single cell, and then that can be transferred to another um, medium here, and you wind up with a, a pure culture eventually as you go through this process several more times.